Hello ladies and gentlemen, I'm Matt from Matt's Bookshelf, and today I'm asking a very simple question. Is the pursuit of art worth it? To solve this question, uh, I am looking at two masterclass works of expatriate fiction. Those are The Recognitions by William Gaddis and Tropical Cancer by Henry Miller. Now why these two authors? Well, they both have very similar backgrounds. Both were American ex expats who moved to Paris for the pursuit of art. Uh, both men were published around their early 30s. Uh, and both men took a very long time to find th the success that they deserve. And also, the recognitions by William Gaddis references Henry Miller's childhood of cancer, so clearly Gaddis was a fan of Henry Miller. But when it comes to the pursuit of art, both men seemingly have polar opposite views on the value of this pursuit. The recognitions and cup of cancer represent art in its purest form. These men do not compromise for markets, for publishers, or what have you. They're going to write what they want, and as a result, we have two legendary works. However, Miller and the Tropic of Cancer has a very different view on the pursuit of art. He believes that it is worth it no matter how much struggle you go through, while Gaz, on the other hand, uh, proposes different solutions for artists who are boldly determined to uh, keep art in its purest form and he offers different solutions as to how they might find fulfillment in their life. Whereas Miller, it is the only way he can find fulfillment. And through this video, I'll explore why both men feel what they feel, and if there's any underlying messages throughout the novel that might hint to more complexity to these views. Miller begins Tropic of Cancer with bleakness and despair, and it only gets worse from there. It's sort of ironic, considering what I just said that Henry Miller has the more optimistic uh, view of the pursuit of art. He values it more uh, uh, than William Gaddis does. But when you read the first page of Henry Miller's Recognitions, you wouldn't really get that. It feels very bleak and very uh, sardonic, but it sets the tone for the rest of the novel. This novel is going to be gritty, it's going to be dirty, but above all, it's going to be honest. From the opening page, Miller portrays his setting as hopelessly bleak. As a struggling expatriate writer in Paris, his living conditions are as followed. I am living in the Villa Borghese. There is not a crumb of dirt anywhere, nor a chair misplaced. We are alone here, and we are dead. Boris has just given me a summary of his views. He is a weather prophet. The weather will continue bad, he says. There will be more calamities, more death, more despair. Paris in Tropic of Cancer is grotesque, seedy, and above all, alive. Henry Miller spares no detail in the putrid nature of his environment and the people who make their homes here. Clinging to Paris like flies and maggots to a decaying organism, one Sunday afternoon while walking the streets, Miller observes, around Union Square or the upper reaches of the Bowery, one was drawn to the Dime Museum, where in the show of windows there were displayed wax reproductions of various organs of the body eaten away by syphilis and other venereal diseases. The city sprouts like a huge organism, diseased in every part, the beautiful thoroughfares only a little less pus because they have not been drained of pus. Paris is an organism, and a repulsive one at that. Portraying his city specifically as an organ, or a collection of organs to make up a body, is particularly interesting because, though his city is alive, it does not possess a personality. Paris may have all the qualities of a living being, but like our own organs which function solely to keep us alive, it lacks a consciousness to separate itself as its own unique life form. But like all organisms, conscious or not, Paris is susceptible to age, disease, and rot. When Boris predicts that more death will come, he is not only speaking of human life. Through Miller's eyes, the reader gets a sense that Paris is dying. It is an old organ performing its function, but it has been crippled and made ugly by age and disease. But how does such a hopeless environment affect the people living in it, especially those expatriates who moved away to develop their skills as artists? Like many writers before him, Henry Miller left home from mainland Europe to find success as an author, only to discover that life abroad was not as easy as he believed. While struggling for recognition and fame, Miller lived in intense poverty, many of the stories of which are recounted in Tropic of Cancer. From the first page, Miller makes it abundantly clear that his living conditions are far from stellar, and his dreams of moving abroad and working as an artist have not turned out the way he envisioned them. 
and yet, despite his financial struggles, he claims to be the happiest man alive. He moved abroad to become an artist, and in his eyes, the task has been completed. For Miller, no matter all the trials he is forced through, whether it be extreme poverty, physical or emotional pain, all these trials and all this pain is worth it in the end if the goal is for the artist to keep his work of art in its purest form. It is only later on in the novel though that he reveals that to him, the artist is not human. It is a sub form of human, it's caught somewhere between human and carnivorous predator. Rather than wallow in the hopelessness of a self appointed purpose, Henry Miller adapts. He has dedicated his life to the pursuit of art his own goals working against a society that is structurally designed to subdue human will and individuality. People are designed to fail. They are made to serve a purpose, like any machine or organ in the body, stripped of meaning except to perform a task. Miller rejects this notion, and he would rather live in severe poverty in the pursuit of art than conform to a failing superstructure. This, however, forces change. In a malicious society, he cannot use civility to fight the overbearing pressure to conform. So he answers the attacks of a world without morals by writing himself with morals too. The world is a predator, and in order to rebel, he must become a predator too. I am only spiritually dead. Physically, I am alive. Morally, I am free. The world which I have departed is a menagerie. The dawn is breaking on a new world, a jungle world in which the lean spirits roam with sharp claws. If I am a hyena, I am a lean and hungry one. I go forth to fatten myself. An animal, especially one living in the wild, is concerned with one thing, survival. Henry Miller does not care to be perceived as an intellectual, but a starving predator, ready to kill and eat as he sees fit. Writing and art, after all, are selfish pursuits. Miller's creative process is performed by himself, and he is the only one who will benefit from the goals he has set. Above all, Miller is focused on honesty, and he will not attempt to blind himself on the mythologized stories of the successful and groundbreaking writers who came before him. The jungle that is Paris, and likely the whole world too, preys on humans, not necessarily on their lives, but on their individuality. In order to survive, he must become a predator, as the weak are doomed to be trampled over. Referring back to his obsession with organic imagery, Miller uses flesh to distinguish what is authentic in the writer's work. The hyena, which is hungry for meat, parallels Miller's hunt for artistic authenticity. Tropic of Cancer in itself is the pursuit of flesh, as it captures the genuine thoughts and actions of the author himself as he navigates the jungle. However, the predator imagery he invokes is not entirely fitting, and Miller recognizes it. The artist and hyena, though they may be unrelenting in their ambitions, the goals of both species are not equal. The hyena's mind is occupied on hunting for survival, and the artist's mind is focused on creation. The hyena lives its life, never questioning the meaning of his role in it, while the artist is obsessed with these abstract issues. In short, the artist exists as its own unique species somewhere between human and animal. According to Miller, the main difference between human and artist comes from the mind. The human conforms to societal norms, while the artist is victim to an impulse pushing him toward individuality. Side by side with the human race, there runs another race of beings, the inhuman ones, the race of artists who, goaded by unknown impulses, take the lifeless mass of humanity and by the fever and ferment with which they imbue it turns the soggy dough into bread, and the bread into wine, and the wine into song. I see this other race of individuals ransacking the universe, turning everything upside down, their feet always moving in blood and tears, their hands always empty, always clutching and grasping for the beyond, for the god out of reach. The artist's impulse to create is instinctual, which is what separates him from the rest of humanity. There is no inherent reward from fermenting the soggy dough into bread, but the artist does so anyway, due to an untraceable desire. Miller writes that the artist is ransacking the universe, so at least from his perspective, the artist is capable of superhuman feats. This power, however, is not without its flaws. In addition to the aforementioned poverty, both financially and emotionally, artists are infinitely questioning and confused about the deeper meaning of the world. Their hands always empty, always clutching and grasping for the beyond, for the god out of reach. The bold questions they search answers for may never be found, but they pursue them nonetheless. Though self-aggrandizing, Miller is not saying that artists will change the world for the better, as the world in its dying state may be too far gone to be saved. 
He is suggesting, however, that if society can be changed, it is the race of people known as artists who will lead the revolution, as they are the ones who ponder deeply over the world's problems and use creativity to seek solutions. The Recognitions is William Gaddis' first novel, and whereas Henry Miller's Shot the Cancer captures his protagonist already deep in the state of disillusionment, Gaddis's protagonist, Wyatt, who is a young artist uh, who grew up in New England uh, and is the son of a pastor of a Protestant church, um, he builds to that disillusionment. He starts off naive and wide-eyed as he moves to Paris, believing that he can uh, become an artist without having compromise on his morals, but as the novel builds, he slowly becomes disillusioned. Wyatt experiences very similar trials to the protagonist's Tropic of Cancer as he tries to remain pure in his artistic pursuits, but as the novel goes on, he goes after trial after trial, um, the, the pain of what he's, the pain and the hopelessness of what he's enduring inevitably breaks him and he falls into a state of disillusionment, and this can be tracked through how he sees Paris and how that uh, setting evolves over time. Paris, upon arrival, represents the mindset of the protagonist. The city, through the eyes of Wyatt, is a time capsule, preserving the creativity-driven culture and made famous in the first half of the 20th century. To further emphasize Wyatt's naivety, Gaddis gives the audience a detailed expression of Paris through the protagonist's perspective. Marvelous to wide eyes, prickled ears, and minds of that erectile quality of betraying naive qualms of transatlantic origin was this spectacle of culture fully realized. They regarded as the height of excellence that nothing remained to be done, no tree to be planted, nor building torn down, no tree too low, nor building too high, no bud of possibility which had not opened in the permanent bloom of artificial flowers, no room for that growth which is the abiding flower of humility. Paris is visually perfect, at least from the perspective of the wide-eyed and prickle-eared. To the tourist or newcomer, there is nothing about Paris that needs to change, or be added, or taken away. Even as far as the number of trees and heights of buildings, everything within the city is flawless. This fantasy of the expatriate artists, no matter the profession, cannot be maintained over a long period of time. The lives of the expatriates who inspired the disgust protagonists and their authors alike have certainly been glamorized by history, and it is this lie which convinces someone like Wyatt Guion that his dream can be achieved through dedication, and that Paris possesses an inherent artistic value due to its mythologized history and welcoming aesthetic. And so, it is not that Paris is structured somehow mathematically perfect, but that Wyatt and other expatriates need to perceive it that way to justify their dreams and blind themselves from the crushing reality for as long as possible. But whatever perfection Wyatt perceives in his early days in Paris is quickly grounded in reality. At first, he attempts to make money on his art alone, producing original pieces in the hope of attracting a following through his skill. Unfortunately, this passion was unnoticed by the public, causing both Wyatt's income and optimism to drop substantially. And with isolation and emotional frailty, ego overwhelms the protagonist, operating as a defense mechanism. Miller's diatribes about the importance of artists, though there is certainly truth in his statements, can be seen as a way of overcompensating for his lack of success in poor living conditions. He has to use hyperbole when discussing the cultural and societal importance of the poor and starving artists in order to justify his current prospects, which to most eyes may be seen as less than desirable. Why Guion follows a similar path, creating a defensive wall of ego to obtain a degree of superiority to the world around him. While walking home, he spots artists selling their paintings to tourists on the streets of Montmartre and promptly turns his nose up to them. He might walk up occasionally to see them, the alleys infested with them painting the same picture from different angles, the same painting varying from easel to easel as different versions of a misunderstood truth. To Wyatt, these artists are all the same, painting the same scene over and over again to make money off naive tourists. Of course, the irony of this ego is made more apparent later when Wyatt reduces himself to an even worse fate when he makes a deal with Rectal Brown to create false copies of paintings and sell them off as originals. Referring to the easels as depicting a misunderstood truth is particularly telling, as the idealized version of Paris they paint for tourists reflects the same way Wyatt viewed the city on his arrival, that is, too perfect to be real. His disgust 
is not directly targeted at the artists themselves, but the paintings they make serve as a constant reminder of his loss of innocence. As Wyatt's mental health deteriorates and his artistic dreams become less and less attainable, his setting reflects this increase in overall morbidity. Gaddis portrays this turn as an exposure of the true appearance of Paris, writing, But even the streets and the lights showing along the streets looked different, recalling nakedness and angular displeasure, summoning the fabled argument between the sun and wind, distending the brief Rue Vivienne into the crowded desolation of Maximilian Strauss. The Paris Wyatt once saw is nothing more than a deception. This new Paris, with its angular and disagreeable features, has lost its welcome and spectacle, morphing into just another desolate city rendered unremarkable in the rest of the world. Gaddis not only uses his descriptions to directly parallel and contradict his earlier romanticized descriptions, but Wyatt himself notes this change and is thrown off by it. Whereas Miller recreates his environment to match his mood, Wyatt's world is changing without his knowing. He is slipping into a darker state of mind, and the transition, too, might be happening unconsciously. While living languidly in Madrid, Wyatt spends the majority of his time in a brothel. He forms a bond with one of the prostitutes, Pastora, and their relationship becomes so close that she stops taking money from him. Years later, Wyatt's departure from Spain causes them to separate, and now at his return he's suddenly overwhelmed with the desire to relocate her and the daughter they had together. A daughter, yes, born out of not love, but born out of love. When it happened, the bearing, the present reshaped the past, and the suitors, oh Christ, not slaying the suitors, no, never, but to supersede where they failed. With these words, Wyatt sets out to complete his odyssey. He has returned home to Ithaca, and he has yet to reunite with his family. Comparing Pastor to Penelope adds significant depth to their relationship, and if he loves her anywhere near how Odysseus loves Penelope, then Wyatt's decision to forsake his artistic pursuits for familial ones may be the change he needs to correct his life. During the conversation with Ludi, Wyatt repeats the phrase, living it through, after vaguely addressing his mistakes. This appears to be a phrase of endurance, as he has committed himself to facing his problems rather than running from them. Ultimately, Wyatt's desire to find Pastor and their daughter shows the most determination in the character since initially moving to Paris for his career as a painter. As if prophetic, the futile pursuit of art that most characters embark on in the recognitions reflects William Gaddis's own career after publishing his first novel. At the time of its release, the novel was met with confusion and resentment from literary critics. However, it received an underground following that persisted long enough for Gaddis to be given a second chance and finally received the praise he deserved. William Gass, a Gaddis scholar, speculates on why the novel was so poorly received by critics initially, writing, the book was about bamboozlers, the slowest wits could see that, and therein saw themselves and therewith withdrew. This was not to be a slow evening of soporific entertainment, it was to be their indecent exposure. Gaddis would know better than anyone else just how unfair the pursuit of art can be, especially when the critics themselves were out to disgrace him. Gaddis would not publish another book for the next 20 years, understandably upset with the reaction toward the recognitions. Other main characters in the recognitions who are also pursuing art uh, do not fare any better than Wyatt's. You have Otto, who is a playwright, and he ends the novel exiled from the United States. He has to move to a war-torn country in South America where he's penniless, and he seemingly has no hope uh, to ever really achieve what he wants. And you also have Stanley, who's a pianist, who does have his moment of glory at the very end of the novel in which he is playing his music uh, to a church in Italy. However, this it is through his playing that the church crumbles and kills him, so he's literally being killed by his own work. Though their feelings and their virtues of the pursuit of art may differ substantially, neither Gaddis nor Miller wallow in defeat. For Henry Miller, the artist must mentally transform himself into a predatory animal in order to combat the psychological strain of his failures and continue forth with his aspirations. Though Miller's protagonist puts on a hard exterior for the audience, there is an underlying sadness to this character. One who has been hurt and disillusioned so many times that he must literally reduce himself to his primal urges to endure this self-imposed exile. There is, however, tremendous beauty, bravery found in Miller's mission, 
fighting against the sick and dying world, hellbent on breaking artists down. It is through this struggle against overwhelming odds that we understand just how much the pursuit of pure and unfiltered art means to him, and considering how he is regarded today among the expatriate writers, it is safe to say that Miller defied the odds. William Gaddis in The Recognitions offers a different solution for the apparently hopeless pursuit of the aspiring artist living abroad. As the novel unfolds, Wyatt technically gets to fulfill his dreams, but with a Faustian catch. He is employed as a criminal tasked with creating replicas of iconic paintings and then selling them as originals. On one hand, his skill to replicate the works of legendary artists like Hieronymus Bosch speaks to his own skill as a painter. On the other hand, he is forced to compromise on his morals, and the crimes he commits break him spiritually and mentally. Gaddis' solution to Wyatt's problem is not one anyone would expect from a fellow artist. Instead, throughout Wyatt's countless trials as he tries to make it as a professional painter, it is not until he considers giving up art entirely that he finds the potential for happiness. At the end of the novel, isolated in a monastery in Spain, touching up old paintings he did years ago in France, Wyatt finally finds inspiration when he comes to the conclusion that he should search for his daughter and the woman he formerly had a relationship with. Though it, this is not necessarily a total rejection of art, Wyatt's new ambition is the first he comes up with on his own as unrelated to the pursuit as a painter. Though he could certainly still work on his paintings even as a family man, Wyatt appears excited that he can finally focus his efforts on something else besides a craft which has done nothing else but destroy him. Though William Gaddis and Henry Miller offer opposing solutions to the individual's pursuit of uncompromised art, they both inherently tap in on the legitimacy of the pursuit. A career in the arts is by and large a thankless profession. No matter the intent, sacrifice, or passion, none of these qualities guarantee success. And as Wyatt proves, even having a career in one's passion does not guarantee happiness. Miller believes the mission of the artist to be worth any sacrifice or hardship. Though he admits that the expatriate writer's life is far from easy, he still views it as a superior to any mundane way of living. Like the carnivorous animal, the artist does not need comfort to survive. As the predator is forced to remain hungry and vicious in a cruel kingdom of animals, the artist too must evolve into a similar mindset to survive the ruthlessness of his world. Considering the expatriate artists of the time were producing brilliant works with little to no recognition or profit, it is no wonder why Miller suggests channeling a primal version of oneself to block off the negative emotions that come with consistent failure. William Gaddis, on the other hand, does not believe the artist is a separate kind of human. If anything, the recognitions puts a special emphasis on the humanity of each of its featured artists. To further oppose Henry Miller's philosophy, Gaddis believes that the pursuit of art is not worth the sacrifice of humanity. This is most apparent in the endings of Wyatt and Stanley. Wyatt, who recognizes that there is more to life than his art, ends his story on an open note. Certainly, there is room for further tragedy, as he may never find his former lover and the daughter they had together, but there is also the potential for positivity. Wyatt is finally trying to learn from his mistakes and explore a new, or perhaps dormant, interest outside of his obsession with art. Though family life may not guarantee the happiness he longs for, his pursuits in painting have continuously kept him down, making his new pursuit, at the very least, worth a try. And so we have our comparisons between William Gaddis and Henry Miller. These works are very dense and sort of nebulous at times, so uh, maybe I interpreted them incorrectly. Um, let me know what you think of these books. Let me know what you think of the video. This is just my perspective on what I uh, thought of the books. And um, especially because Gaz references Henry Miller and the recognitions, you can tell that they do have somewhat close ties. I just found it really interesting that both men were very uncompromising in the works they made, but also seemingly have different perspectives on the torture of the of the artist in his life so yeah let me know what you think if you I also like i'm a huge fan of expatriate literature so if you have recommendations for expatriate literature uh please recommend them to me in the comments below because i usually put those to the top of my tbr because i love them so much and um i will continue to probably be making more expatriate videos in the future um because i have a lot to say on the subject and i'll be talking more about the recognitions and traffic of cancer as uh time goes on. So yes, thank you if you made it this far, and check out my other videos, and hope they'll see you for the next one. Thank you, and goodbye.